Imagine finding half a billion dollars worth of gold, silver, and jewels in the middle of the ocean. What would you do with that kind of cash? That's what former chicken farmer Mel Fisher had to ask himself when he stumbled across one of the most exciting collections of hidden treasure in human history. And as much as people tried to steal it, including the government, he managed to hold on to his fortune. Since then, he's been dubbed the world's greatest treasure hunter. So how'd he do it? And what did he find exactly? Let's dive in and find out. Every day leading up to the find, Mel would tell his family and crew that today was the day that they were going to find the mother load. That's right, 450 million was the value of Mel Fisher's groundbreaking underwater discovery. Keep in mind, however, that he and his crew found this collection way back in 1985. Accounting for inflation, that value skyrockets to over $957 million. Can you even comprehend that kind of money? I can't. If Mel Fisher made the average American income of $48,000 today, he would have needed to work, get ready for this, a whopping 19,950 years in order to save up the equivalent of what he found that day at the bottom of the ocean. While Mel didn't get to keep all that treasure, after years of legal battles, he was allowed to keep most of it. And that's still a hefty paycheck. As anyone, but we'll touch base on that a little bit later. First, let's rewind. Who is the treasure hunter fisher guy anyway? Is he a pirate, a luck stricken swimmer, and what exactly did he find? Well, folks, it's your classic rags to riches story. A young Mel Fisher grew up in Indiana, but it was the day he relocated to old sunny California that would prove the first step in what would become a career as the world's most famous treasure hunter. He worked, of all places, on a chicken farm owned by the Horton family. This is where he met his sweetheart, the daughter of the farm's owners, Dolores Horton, that's the gal. With a passion for scouring the waters, the pair teamed up and opened up the first diving shop in the state of California, called Mel's Aqua Shop, smack bang right behind the chicken farm in a rickety old shed. In that shed, they trained over 65,000 people to scuba dive and revolutionize the local industry. They didn't just stick to training, though. They also set off on their own adventures, from dredging for gold in California rivers to swimming across the Panama Canal in search of treasure. They did it all. As it turns out, Dolores had her own claim to fame. She was one of the first women to learn how to dive and set a seriously impressive record by staying underwater in a 10-foot deep tank for 55 hours and 37 minutes nonstop. How long could you have lasted beneath the surface? Not that long, I bet. But try as they might, their findings remained relatively small. That didn't stop Mel, though. He was determined to uncover something bigger. Then he spent the better part of two decades in search of one particular ship, the Nuestra Senora de Atocha, formerly owned by King Philip IV, which sank in a hurricane off the Florida Keys. Despite years and years of searching, he didn't find much. But then, on June 13th, 1971, he was given a clue. One of the divers working for Fisher, a man named Don Kincaid, resurfaced from a dive holding something shiny, coiled up like a small snake. That was no snake, though. That was nearly eight feet of heavy, solid gold chain. At that moment, Mel knew he was closing in. He found three more silver bars in 1973 and five bronze cannons in 1975. He was getting close, and he could feel it. Still, the Atocha shipwreck continued to elude divers, investigators, and explorers. In total, for well over 350 years. As far as we know, it simply vanished. Did someone say Bermuda Triangle? Flash forward to July 20th, 1985, the day that finally changed it all. After 16 and a half years of an investor-funded seabed search, any guess? Guesses which person found the infamous wreck? That's right, Mel Fisher. In waters 55 feet below Fisher's boat, two of his divers, Andy Matroki and Greg Wareheim, found the treasure, a treasure we'd all be quickly referring to as the Atocha Motherlode. And a motherlode it was. Aside from 40 tons worth of pure gold and silver, ancient valuable artifacts littered the shipwreck, as well as 71 pounds of Colombian emeralds, gold coins, and close to 114,000 Spanish silver coins known as pieces of eight. Pretty darn lucky, right? On top of the obvious shiny stuff, Fisher's crew found a number of extremely rare and unique Bezoar stones. Never heard of a Bezoar stone? They're about the size of an egg, but they're not eggs. They're found in the digestive systems of llamas and other two-stomached animals, and were thought to have the superpower of removing any poisons from liquid. And remember, in the 17th century, poisoning wine goblets was all the rage. And Fisher found proof of this, too. In 1990, he published a report that not only showed the treasure he found, but also a diet and menu list for the crew. Any guesses what the only item included in every meal was? Wine. Wonder if that has any correlation with the sinking. 
Anyway, how was it possible for a boat carrying so many valuable goods to sink in the first place? Especially when it was part of a 28-ship convoy. All right, first of all, that treasure was way heavy. Like, it took two months to load it all the way onto the ship kind of heavy. A toucher wouldn't have lasted long once water flooded the deck with such an unusually high weight, especially not when there was a hurricane brewing. A couple days after leaving Havana, Atocha and its fleet found itself in the eye of the storm about 87 miles or 140 kilometers from Havana, not too far from the Florida Keys. It ravaged the ships and all but five of the Atocha passengers perished. As it turns out, after centuries laying on the ocean floor, this would prove to be one of the biggest underwater findings in history, but not the biggest. The Black Swan Project uncovered around $500 million worth of silver and gold coins back in 2007, while the most valuable shipwreck of all time, the San Jose, worth about $20 billion, yeah, billion, was found in 2015, although kept secret for a while by the Colombian government amid controversy. Abu! Don't touch anything. Mel Fisher had his fair share of controversy, too, and plenty of personal hardships. You know the saying, finders keepers? Well, apparently that state government of Florida didn't give a rat's butt about those old cliches. In their eyes, since the wreck was found in Floridian waters, the state deserved the title to the wreck. But Mel, who'd worked tirelessly, was not giving in. He was determined that the right of the treasure was his and his alone, so he fought tooth and nail in court to keep it. All up, the legal battle lasted a whopping eight years before the United States Supreme Court court finally ruled in favor of Fisher on the 1st of July, 1992. With an interesting provision, Mel's company would have to donate 20% of the artifacts to the state of Florida. That's not to mention the millions of dollars in legal fees he forked out. It wasn't just legal obstacles and money drama that slowed down Fisher, though, no. Sadly, he was dealt a heartbreaking blow in 1975. When his oldest son, Dirk, Dirk's wife, Angel, and one of his divers, Rick Gage, were on the quest for treasure, they met their early fate when their boat was capsized. However, Mel kept fighting, and by eventually finding the treasure, he was able to honor their legacies. Obstacles and challenges aside, at the end of the day, one thing was beyond doubt. Mel had accomplished his dream. Once he'd found his first sliver of treasure, he was hooked. And unlike all the naysayers and quitters out there, Mel never gave up. He'd go around saying things like, Never give up on your dreams. Always believe in what you do, even when things don't go as you planned. Ah, uh, thanks, Mel. That's Willie's. Save that for Willie. Anything else? Now back to the monstrous pile of shiny gold, silver, and emeralds. What would you do with it? Sell it and pocket the cash? Put them on display? Drop a line in the comments and let us know. But what about Mel? How did he spend it? Aside from the 20% donations and legal fees, he opened up two museums, the Mel Fisher Maritime Heritage Museum, which displays an extensive collection of artifacts, and Mel Fisher's Treasure Museum, which was opened in an abandoned fire station, both based in Florida. Not all the goods and artifacts are on display, though. Mel decided to offload a few items in order to bulk up that bank account, baby. Remember the Bezoar stones? He sold one of those at auction, raking in somewhere between $28,000 and $35,000. A gold and enamel spoon of Peruvian and Spanish origin was sold too, estimated to reach between $160,000 and $180,000, while a knee-length gold chain would have netted him another fifty grand. One of Mel's favorite items was put to auction too, one that he actually wore, a heavy gold chain that hung past his waist. The price? Between ninety and hundred and twenty grand. Not too bad. And remember, that was all just from one haul. While it sits in the shadow of his landmark discovery, Fisher actually found another famous ship, the Atocha's sister ship named the Santa Margarita. She too sunk as a result of the hurricane, but was found earlier than her sister in 1980. Well, part of a wreck at least. Sure, there was some gold and silver, but the real eye-opener on Santa Margarita was a lead box. On the outside, it didn't look like much, but on the inside, it contained a startling 16,184 rare and invaluable pearls. What do you think you're doing? Oh, we weren't gonna keep it. We were just playing. While Mel himself is no longer with us, at least he can say that he ticked finding half a billion bucks worth of treasure off his bucket list. These days, his family continues his legacy, operating the museums and running the website which sells some of the coins and artifacts collected from the deep sea. Yep, you really can buy a pair of shipwrecked earrings. And just because a tocha was found, that doesn't mean there's no sunken treasure left out there. In fact, there's almost too much to fathom. The Merchant Royale, known as the El Dorado of the Sea, is somewhere down there. And if you're not into diving, then why not look for the crown jewels of Ireland, the Florentine diamond, or the $142 million lost amber room. They're not going to find themselves. This is the second time I've had to reclaim my property from you. That belongs in a museum. 
If you can't get enough of sunken ships, then we've got a video about how the Titanic really sunk, plus heaps of other awesome content to keep you putting off all those important things until the cows come home. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time back here on The Richest.